that after the Juma, we'll have uh, the young Cardi here who's going to recite some verses of the Quran. So um, please stay in attendance for that. Inshallah, same on it. Thank <laughs> you. 
Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمدا رسول الله أشهد أن محمدا رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلا حي على الفلا الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له وما هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله دعوة one story and one hadith and then we'll expand upon that inshallah so as for the hadith it's a well-known hadith in which abu sa'id radiallahu anhu reports the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that essentially that anyone who has an adam's weight of iman an adam's weight of iman so imagine how much adam weighs we can't even so it's so ridiculously small we can't even imagine how much that weighs anyone who has an adam's weight of iman will never enter jahannam they will never enter the hellfire. Right? So just think about that. And Adam's weight of Iman. So Iman, you can weigh it on scale, <laughs> in a way. Another one is an incident that is indirectly mentioned in the Quran. So <coughs> there's a very it's not, not it's not a well known battle, right? That happened in the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we know about the battles such as the Battle of Badr, where three hundred Muslims uh, fought thousands of fought and they won even though they were outnumbered or 313 as they say we also know the battle of Uhud in which the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was injured because of the archers and they them disobeying his command and the Muslims unfortunately lost in that battle and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentions that in the Quran <coughs> but a battle that's not that well known is called the battle of Hamra al-Asad 
people don't really know about this battle. And it happened literally directly after the Battle of Bukhara. So what happened is that the Muslims are obviously defeated from the Battle of Bukhara, right? They're injured, some of them are missing limbs, some of them are uh, missing like, legs and things like that. And so they're obviously not in a position to fight, so they're retreating back to Medina. And so the Quraysh, who at the time were not Muslim, obviously, they were still upon the shirk, who were still polytheists, they decided that, look, the Muslims, they're weak. They're injured, their morale is down, let's just finish them off right now. Let's just kill them. Like, they can't do anything. What are they going to do? One guy doesn't have an arm, he can't lift a sword to fight me. Another guy, he's like, he's defeated, he's, his morale is down, so let's just finish them off and end this one. And so, they circled around the Muslims, and they said, uh, basically, that you all are finished, so fear us. Fear us now. Be afraid of us. And so the Prophet Muhammad and the Sahaba, keep in mind, the Prophet Muhammad in this battle, he was hit, so he was wearing, you have to imagine, back in those days, people were wearing armor, right? So they'd be wearing like helmets and things like that. Someone hit the Prophet Muhammad on his head <coughs> with a sword, and the helmet seeped into his head because of the impact. So the Prophet Muhammad was injured on his head. People were injured on their arms, their legs, their whole, their whole body. And of course, their morale is down. They just lost the battle. So they're not going to feel as motivated and as powerful to fight. <coughs> and so, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, there we go. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran is that. The when the Muslims heard the Quraysh taunting them and saying, Be afraid of us. We're about to finish you all off. We're about to kill you all. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fazadahum iman. Which means that their iman grew. Now imagine, uh, you just got beat up. And you have after you get beat up, people and the people who the person who beat you up is telling you, Be afraid of me. You get less afraid of them. Right? And you become more audacious. And so then the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Sahaba said, which means that Allah is sufficient for us. Even though we're injured, even though we're beaten, Allah is enough for us. We don't need anything else. Even though we're injured, we don't need anything else. As long as Allah is by our side, we're going to win. And then the Quraysh, they heard this, and they were like, people are crazy. Like, like, we just beat them, and we're about to kill them, and they're still not afraid of us. And they got so afraid that they ran away. Now I want to focus on the part where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَزَادَهُمْ iman." And where in the hadith the Prophet Muhammad says that someone can have an added weight of Iman. We hear all the time people talk about Iman and what it is and how it can increase and decrease. But I just want to go over the basics again because I feel like that's very important and I'll keep the khutbah short, inshallah. About what is Iman and how exactly does it increase and decrease. So I ask you all, even though of course you can't respond, what is Iman? Now people will say Iman means faith or belief. Now, that doesn't necessarily capture the entire meaning of what Iman is, right? Because if you say that Iman just means to believe something or to have knowledge of something, that's not correct. And the reason I'll say that is because, I thought, I'll actually let me not uh, go too far. So you've got to say this belief, that's not a proper definition. Another person would say, who's a bit, who's, um, who knows a bit more, they would say that Iman is the six pillars of Iman. So belief in Allah, right? Believing that Allah is the only one worthy of worship. Believing that Allah uh, is the Lord of the heavens and the earth, that he's the guardian over it. And believing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has unique names and attributes, right? So believing in Allah, believing in the books, believing in the prophets, Musa, uh, Isa, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, all these prophets. Uh, believing in the day of judgment and believing in Qadr which means believing that Allah has control over all things and that everything that happens is in the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which could side things people confused about that. They wonder, okay, do we have free will then if Allah knew what we were going to do? So qadr is of two types, right? So there's qadr, which you have no control over. Where you're born, when you're born, what you look like, things like that. Really quickly. And then second type is the qadr where we have control over what we do. Everything that we do, we have control over. Every action that we have, <coughs> like me giving this khutbah, or you coming here to listen to the khutbah, or you praying, or anything like that, Allah gave you the ability to do that. You have the free will to do that. But it is under Allah's control. So if Allah did not want you to do it, and you wanted to do it, it doesn't matter what He wants, Allah will stop it from happening. 
So that's basically what Qadr is, just to give a brief explanation. But belief in those six things is Iman. And they're recording the hadith of Jibreel in which the Jibreel came to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and asked him what is Islam, what is Iman, and what is Ihsan. And then the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that Iman is those six things. Now, again, this is technically correct, but there's a problem. And it goes back to the problem of thinking that Iman is just believing in something. In terms of like the English language, how we use the word belief. Because, do you know who else believes in Allah? Who else believes in the prophets? Who else believes in the angels? Who else believes in the books and the day, the day of judgment and Qadr? You know who else believes in that? Shaitan. If we have heard have Shaitan right here, well, Billah, we don't want Shaitan anywhere near us. But if Shaitan was right here in front of me, and, or in front of us, and we could ask him, do you believe in Allah? He'll say yes. He saw Allah. Do you believe in the prophets? Yes. He's their number one enemy. He goes against them all the time. Do you believe in the books? Do you believe in the angels? He was amongst the angels. Do you believe in the Day of Judgment? He does believe in the Day of Judgment. He even asked Allah to let him live until the Day of Judgment. Meaning he believes in Allah, he makes dua to Allah, and he believes in him. Or he believes in the Day of Judgment. Do you believe in Qadr? All these things, Shaitan also believes in them. So if Shaitan believes in these things, what, what we're going to say that he's a mu'min? Because to, be, to have Iman, someone who has Iman is called a mu'min, right? A believer. Is Shaitan a believer? Is Shaitan a mu'min? Of course not. Shaitan can't be a mu'min. So what actually is Iman and what distinguishes somebody <coughs> who has Iman to someone who just has knowledge or who just knows something to be true? So first I want to go over the linguistic definition of Iman, right? What Iman means, means linguistically. So Iman comes from the same root as the word Amana in the Arabic language. And Amana is used throughout the Quran, and the word Iman is also used throughout the Quran. So one example is in uh, the famous surah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, basically that, uh, وَأَمَنَهُمْ مِنْ خَوْفِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected the Quraysh, or secured them, or protected them from fear. When he talks about um, the Quraysh and how they used to travel and things like that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he protected them, he gave them Amana. Right? So, Amana means peace and security, but it also does mean to believe in something. So, for example, throughout the whole Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladina aman. O you who have iman, or O you who do aman, or essentially have belief. So, iman does mean belief, but it also means peace and security. So, how do we bring that together? What iman essentially means in the Arabic language is to have a belief, but not only to have a belief, but to have it be something that you are secure in, something that you are positive in, and that gives you peace. So it's not something that you just believe in a sense of, well, I think it might be true. No, you fully believe in it. You fully believe in it, 100%. And it gives you peace and security in that. You feel safe in that belief. You feel secure in that belief. So that's what Iman means linguistically. And then we get to um, what the scholars talk about Iman is made up of. So the scholars say that Iman is made up of three things. Now a lot of people will say that Iman is just something that is in your heart. And it, that is true. Iman is in your heart, but it is also on your tongue and on your lips. And I will explain that in a minute. So if we say Iman is just action of the, of the heart, right? What do we mean by that? So part of having an action of the heart is to have knowledge of something, right? So to know that Allah exists, to know that there's a day of judgment, to know that there is a book sent down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? To have knowledge of that. Then there's to have yaqeen. Yaqeen means certainty. That means you absolutely 100% believe it without a doubt. Billah shak, as they say in Arabic. No, no doubt in it, right? Now this, these two, is what shaitan has. Shaitan knows Allah exists. Not only does he know Allah exists, he has yaqeen that Allah exists. Because he saw, he spoke to Allah directly, right? So that's yaqeen. Shaitan has that. What shaitan does not have in the aspect of the heart is the third thing. And this third thing ties into the, the actions of the tongue and the actions of the limbs that I spoke about before. And that is to have an emotional attachment with that, with that belief, with that knowledge. So let me give you a practical example. Let's say... For example, I say, let's say I have a wife, inshallah, one day I get married, inshallah. And 
I say I love my wife, right? If I say, okay, I know I have a wife, I have certainty that I have a wife, but it's not in my heart necessarily that I love her. Do I really love her then? No. If I don't have that emotional attachment, that emotional uh, part of my heart that says that I love this woman, then I don't really have that in my heart that I love her. And that ties into the actions of the tongue and the actions of the limbs. So for the actions of the tongue, which is the aspect of Iman, that goes into saying, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Saying that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah. So there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah. You have to say that. Right? That's what makes you a Muslim. So you have to say it, and you also have to actually do things that show that you believe that. Actions of the limbs. Now, what that essentially looks like is, for example, of course you don't have to be perfect, but praying some type of prayers, sometimes, at least to the best of your ability. Fasting during Ramadan. Doing something. Now that might sound to some strange, that might be like, okay, faith is in my heart, that's all it is. And that's true, faith is in your heart. But again, going back to the love analogy. Let's say, uh, for example, you have a child. Many of us here have children. You say you love the child, but you don't feed the child, you don't take care of him, you don't look after him or her, you don't do anything for that child. Or again, you have a wife, you don't, you don't tell your wife that you love her, you don't do anything for her, nothing. But you say, oh, I love her, and it's in my heart. Do you really love her then? You don't. You might say it, but your actions speak otherwise. As this, the saying goes, actions speak louder than words. So this, in the same token, and to Allah is a better example, you doing these actions, praying, fasting, uh, reading the Quran, these things are a physical manifestation of your belief, love, and submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll conclude here, and we'll, let's ask Allah for forgiveness. We'll, we'll conclude this first part of the khutbah, and let's ask Allah for forgiveness. So, really quickly, and I promise this football will be quick, we went over what Iman is, so the course of the six pillars of Iman that Iman is built off of, right? Then there is what Iman looks like in reality, in practical terms. So you have it in your heart that you have knowledge of Allah or of the prophets or anything like that. You have certainty in that, and you have an emotional attachment which drives you to say statements that confirm your beliefs, so to say that there's no God except for Allah, to say that there's the, that, uh, there's the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa the final prophet, and that there are other prophets before him, to say that you believe in the angels and things like this, and to do actions of the limbs. And like I said, these actions are a physical manifestation of your belief and your love in Allah. So, with that, knowing that what you do actually impacts your iman, it's not just what you believe or what you say, it's also what you do. There are levels to Iman. So this explains why the Prophet Muhammad said that anyone with an Adam's weight of Iman will enter Jannah. Because there is an actual minimum, there's literally a minimum amount of Iman you can have. It's not just a theoretical concept. It's something that manifests in your daily life. So the lowest level of having Iman is, there's three levels. Now, obviously, of course, everyone's on a spectrum. It's not just, oh, you're 100% this and you're 100% that. But this is a general spectrum for us to look at and to reflect, where do I fit in in this, right? And sometimes we might be a little bit on one side or a little bit on the other. But it's just a general way of to, for us to look and see, assess ourselves and be like, where do I fit in this? So the first level is someone called a fasik. So this is somebody who, they're all Muslim. They have Iman. But... Their, their actions are lacking. So a fasik literally means somebody who's a sinner, right? Not just a sinner, because we all sin, obviously, but a major sinner. So a fasik, for example, they are indulging in major sins all the time. And their acts of worship and their, um, let's say, their obligatory actions that they have to do is lacking. So they don't pray when they're supposed to, they don't, their fasting isn't that good. And 
they also do major sins. So like, for example, drinking alcohol or stealing or um, backbiting, things like that. So that's what a facet is. They're still a Muslim, but this is like the lowest, lowest, lowest level. And this person, Allah might forgive this person, but Allah might not, right? Allah might put, put this person to Jannah and he might not. He might have them in Jahannam for a brief period of time, which I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to be in Jahannam for even a split second. Not even a split second. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam talked about, um, and this is a little, a little bit off topic, but just a quick uh, benefit. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam talked about a man who had everything he wanted in this world. He was rich, had the best wife, he had the best uh, house, he had the best car, everything, like anything you can imagine. He just had everything he wanted. And he was dipped into Jahannam for like a split second. Not even he was put there and then he, you left him and then you put him, no. Literally imagine like there's like water here and I have, I don't know, some object and I just dip it like that really quickly. And Allah or someone, he's asked, have you ever felt any happiness in your life, ever? He said, no. Wallahi, I never felt any happiness in my life. I swear to God, I've never felt any happiness in my life. And then the opposite is true. Someone who was poor and oppressed and destitute, Allah took him, put him into Jannah for a split second, and he said he's never felt any pain or suffering in his life ever. So that's just a quick benefit that came to my mind recently. But So a fasik, that would be, you'd be the first one, basically, if you're a fasik. You'd be dipped into Jahannam, or you'd may, maybe stay there for a longer time, and then you'd come out. But nobody wants that. Jahannam, you wouldn't even wish Jahannam on your worst enemy. So that's the lowest level of humanity. The next level is the bare minimum that Allah wants from us. And that's a Muslim. Now obviously, I pass still a Muslim, but when I say Muslim, I mean a regular, general practicing Muslim. That's what I mean. So, just give an example of what that is. There's a hadith narrated by Abu Huraira in Sahih Bukhari. It's a quick story. There was a Bedouin man who came to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So obviously back in those days, there are people who lived in the city, which like the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba and them. And then there were Bedouins, people who lived on the outskirts. <coughs> they lived in tents. They rode on their camels. They, they didn't have a specific place they lived in, basically, right? So a Bedouin came to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he converted to Islam. And he asked the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, um, show me a deed by which I may enter paradise. Show me a deed by which I will enter Jannah. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, worship Allah and don't associate anything with him. So don't do shirk, don't worship an idol, don't worship a man, don't worship the Son of God, apparently, what some people say. Don't do any of that and to believe in Allah alone and to worship him alone. Right? Then to establish the prayer, so to pray five times a day. Not, we're not talking about the Sunnah prayer, like the Nawafil, like the, uh, the prayers that you do that are not obligatory. We're talking about the five obligatory prayers. So to pray those, to give charity, the 2.5% of your wealth, to fast the month of Ramadan, and obviously, of course, including that is to do Hajj. So basically the five pillars of Islam. That's all he said you have to do. And then the man said, by him whose hand is in my is my soul, meaning Allah, basically. By Allah, I will never add anything to it, nor will I lessen anything. Meaning, I'm not going to do more than this, and I'm not going to do less than this. I'm just going to pr pray my five daily prayers, and that's it. I'm going to fast during Ramadan, and that's it. I'm not going to fast Monday and Thursday, which is something that we should do. I'm not going to fast on the the three days in the middle of the month. I'm not going to do any of that. I'm just going to fast during Ramadan, and that's it. Right? Charity, I'm only going to give 2.5% of my wealth, and that is it. That's all I'm going to do. That's it. And so then, the man turned his back and left. And the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said, Whoever is pleased to see a man from the people of paradise, look at this one. He pointed to the better one. So essentially what that means is, what a Muslim is, or a regular practicing Muslim, is to find that somebody who, they do the five pillars, they don't really do much else, they just do the five pillars, right, and other things, and they avoid the major sins. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al Surah Al Nisa, in the in the uh, in this uh, Tishtanibu Kabair, Matan Hauna Anhu, Na Nukafira Ankum Say Atiku, which means those who avoid the major sins, and major sins we know what those are. Things like stealing, murder, you know, things like of course the major sins have levels, not all major sins are the same. So murdering someone not the same as for example uh, not praying or drinking alcohol. Those are major sins, but some are obviously worse than others, right? Murder is like the second or the second or worst sin, I think. Second or third worst sin. 
So uh, the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in Surah Nisa that those who avoid the major sins, right, Allah will remove their, their lesser sins. So that means, for example, I don't give an example of a minor sin, I don't want to trivialize any sin, but a sin that is bad, obviously, but it's of a lesser nature. I don't know, something like, I don't know, maybe swearing or something like that. Something that's a lesser nature of a sin. If you avoid the major sins, Allah will just automatically forgive your minor sins, automatically. And even if you do a major sin, if you repent, meaning that you regret the sin, you turn back to Allah, and you sincerely try your best not to do it again, Allah will forgive that too, as if you never did it. So if you avoid the major sins, Allah will forgive your minor sins. So that's avoiding major sins and doing basically the bare minimum required of a Muslim. Now, this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will enter you into Jannah, He will enter you into heaven, but you'll have Kisar, which means that you're going to be, even though you're going to enter Jannah, you're going to be in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're going to have your book in your hand, and Allah is going to ask you about every single thing you did, even though you're going to Jannah, even though you are guaranteed Jannah, Allah is still going to ask you about every single thing you did, <coughs> which is probably the most frightening thing in human history, to be in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and saying, okay, Allah saying, okay, you did this on this day, why'd you do it? And not only that, if you say, oh, I didn't do it, the limb that you used to do it, like so, let's say for example, you stole, the hand you stole will tell you, no, 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 you stole. I remember you stole on this day on such and such place, <laughs> right? That's still going to happen, but you'll enter Jannah. And you have to walk across the Sirat, which is the bridge that is thinner than a hair over Jahannam. And some people, as the Hadith says, some people will spring through it like really quickly. Other people will kind of, you know, <coughs> they're about to fall, but eventually they'll make it. And that's based on their level of Iman, right? So that's a Muslim. Then, a level above that, and again, this is on a spectrum, obviously, is a Muhsan. So remember in the Hadith of Jibreel, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talked about is- Ihsan. Ihsan is to worship Allah as if you see him, even though you don't see him. So a Muhsan is somebody who's the, at the top level, like they're the best Muslim they could possibly be. Not only are they doing the five pillars, but they do all the sunnah. So they pray all the, um, the non-obligatory prayers, right? They fast on Monday and Thursday, right? They fast on extra days. They give charity more than just 2.5%. They give sadaqah as well, right? So these are people, for example, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is obviously the upper echelon of a muhsan, right? Like, they, you, don't, you don't get more muhsan than, than the prophets. You don't get more uh, perfect than the prophets, right? So uh, an example of a muhsan would be somebody like, for example, Abu Bakr or Umar, radiallahu anhu, like the Sahaba. Or people that we know in our daily life who we just know, like they don't miss a single non-obligatory action. Everything, they don't just do the obligatory action, they do more than that. They're always in the house praying. They pray to Hajjud every single night. I don't know how they do that, but you know, mashallah, Allah, 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 they do stuff like that. That's a muhsan. And a muhsan, they're the rarest, obviously, of the Muslims. Muslims are usually in between, myself included, all of us included, we're usually between Muslim and Fasik. Like we go between those. We do some good deeds, we do some major sins, and then we, you know, go between those. A muhsan, they are one of the, like, of course no one's perfect, but they're almost perfect in a way. Like, they do every single thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands them to do. And when they do a major sin, they immediately repent, or they don't do any major sins. These people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will enter them to Jannah without kisah. That means they don't have to go through having their book in front of them, and having to say, okay, I did this on this such and such date, I did this sin. They don't have to go in front of Allah and do any of that. <coughs> Allah will not ask them any questions. Allah will just enter them into Jannah like that. And of course, this is the rarest person. So, why do I bring this up? Why am I bringing it up? Okay, this is a facet, this is a Muslim, this is a Muslim, a man rises and falls, things like that. Why am I bringing that up? The reason I'm bringing that up is because, essentially, and it seems a bit simple, but it's just something to think about, I want us to kind of reframe how we think about the acts of worship that we do. Right? We pray five times a day. Why? Oh, because Allah told us to. I mean, that's true. But if you think about it in the sense that you praying is a direct reflection of your relationship with Allah, in your belief in Allah. The more you pray, the stronger your connection with Allah is. The stronger your belief in Allah is. Obviously, even the person with a facet, a bad Muslim, as we, as we would say, he believes in Allah, right? But the connection there is not as strong. If you pray, the more often you pray, the more often you give charity, the more often that you smile in the face of your brother, the more often you do good deeds, the more 
that you are connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your belief is stronger than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I just want us to reframe it in that way and to think about it in that way because I think it's important. Sometimes we do things and it's a bit monotonous. We don't really know why we're doing it. But you think about it in the way that, okay, I'm praying five times a day, right? And that's good. I'm a, I'm Muslim. Alhamdulillah, I'm good. But I could be, I could do better. I could be closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let me pray with him. Witr is probably one of the most important uh, Sunnah prayers for us to pray. In fact, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam true, said that the true mark of a believer, essentially, this is a paraphrasing of the Hadith, basically a believer prays Witr. Like, if you're a Muslim, you should pray Witr. Even though it's not obligatory, it's, it's you should do it, right? So you think, okay, I could do better than just the bare minimum required of me, right? So, because I want to get closer to Allah, I want to affirm that I really believe in this religion. I really believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let me pray duha prayer before Fajr. Or let me pray Witr. Or let me pray Tahajr. Or let me give a little bit more in charity than just 2.5%. Right? So just something to think about the fact that our deeds directly reflect, reflect our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our belief in Him. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us in Iman and make us of those He's pleased with. Allah 
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله
very, very inspiring. Yes, sir. Yes, We have these cards here for anyone. Uh, these are going your wallet. I got I got you a very sign um, last week. So anybody that has uh, that doesn't have these, please get those for in case something happens to you, you return to Allah and you are uh, out and about. In this way, the uh, the paramedics or whoever uh, the first responder will know that you are supposed to be um, taken care of at a masjid or the Islamic center. So please get one of those there right in the front um, when you signed in. Also, uh, don't forget your zakat obligations. If you want to do uh, zakat via cash app, it is dollar sign M W S A L A A M. If you want to uh, mail it in, it is PO Box one eight. 02 North of Virginia 23501, or you can mail it in directly to the mass share at 614 West 35th Street, North of Virginia 23508. Also, for members of the community on July 9th, on a Sunday at 1 o'clock, we, um, we will have the community meeting. So make sure I'll keep mentioning that each week as we get closer to July 9th. Uh, July 9th. Tomorrow, inshallah, we'll be doing a parade and a walk for Juneteenth. Um, everyone, hopefully you know what Juneteenth is. If not, we'll be educated by tomorrow, inshallah. So we'll be uh, tomorrow at 9.30 at 1619 uh, Vernon Drive. It's in Digstown. And then we'll walk all the way to the library. So please be in attendance. Everybody you know, your family, friends. Uh, we have to celebrate our um, freedom. Uh, or so much of the freedom that we have endured so far. Uh, so please be there at 9.30. After that, we'll be back here at 11 o'clock to continue on with the celebration with the mass year. So we'll have some, uh, what will we have here? We have vendors, food, games, drumming, and fun tomorrow. Food, books, everyone bring. Please come out, bring your family, bring your friends. It's for Muslims, non-Muslims. Uh, everyone who wants to celebrate the freedom of African American people um, will be right out here on the grass, uh, probably before 11 o'clock. But we, the parade is in a different place, so that's at 9:30, and then we'll be back here at 11 o'clock. Uh, inshallah. Last week I mentioned that um, there is some gentrification going on with Park Place, and I had a note, a letter for people to sign. I have another copy if you didn't get a. Uh, if you weren't able to sign it last week, uh, it's in an effort to have the Newport Gardens um, apartment complex built across the street. Um, so we need your support in having that built across the street uh, because everything else is really being gentrified. The only thing that we really have com control over currently is the 600 block and the 500 block. And I'll mention more of that next uh, tomorrow also, inshallah. What are those things you should do? Um, Please, man. As soon as possible, what we're going to do, I have a meeting with um, uh, Councilwoman uh, Danica Royster, and if as many um, people that I have in support of it, it'll be more likely that they uh, are, are again in support of it, because they voted for it unanimously on more than one occasion, but what happened is they have a boxing gym coming up here. By the way, the boxing gym is only over here because it was a casino. The boxing gym was going to be where the casino is. Now they're going to make a casino here and a boxing gym over here, and they're going to have the grass area as a park and the park across the street. They only need a uh, parking lot, I'm sorry, parking lot for one of those. So we're asking for the parking lot to remain over here for Newport Gardens. So that's what that is. And I can explain it a little bit further, uh, inshallah, tomorrow. Uh, but no, the letters are outside here. As soon as you come out of, uh, for the sisters, as soon as you come out, it's on top of the uh, zakat box, and it's outside for the brothers here. Um, anything else? Yes. Is there a cost for the vendor's table? It is. I think it's $20. Is that right? Today's the last day. Okay. Who you give the money to? If, if you're uh, renting a space, I feel like yeah, if you want to rent the space, it's been paid. And if you need a table, it's 20 Okay. Also, tomorrow, inshallah, I'll be here for a Fajr prayer uh, at 5 o'clock uh, for Saturday and uh, Sunday. And uh, there will be an Arabic class, Arabic class still going on, on Sunday at 11 o'clock. And then after that, we'll have Talim at 1 o'clock. Uh, Alhamdulillah, it was a great experience. I'm glad to have the young people out here. The brother gave a great event. The brother gave a great clipboard. And the young party here did a great job. I knew he was going to. He knows more servers than that. He just didn't want to bless us with all of it today. All right. So, all right. All right. All right. Thank <laughs> you.
Oh yes, I'm sorry, pizza. It's pizza for the kids in the back. Uh, it's halal, pepperoni pizza, and some cheese pizza. But if you're not hungry, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. Uh, let the kids eat first, because I didn't know it was going to be that many people here. <laughs> Today, right now. There's pizza in there right now. Oh. Oh, but the... Not you, you can't get some, but... Nah, sir. You owe me two more syrups. You get a pizza. Oh, yeah.